If you turn with me to, uh, well, yeah, if you still have your Psalters open, turn with me to uh, Lord's Day 9. If you'd like to participate, uh, I'll read the question, and if you respond by reading back the, the answer of Lord's Day 9. And remember, we just started looking, and we're just beginning to look at the Apostles' Creed and this statement, this confession of the Christian faith, very basic um, confession of the Christian faith. So what do you believe when you say, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, that the eternal Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who out of nothing created heaven and earth and everything in them, who still upholds and rules them, by his eternal counsel and providence, is my God and Father because of Christ his Son. I trust him so much that I do not doubt he will provide whatever I need for body and soul, and he will turn to my good whatever adversity he sends me in this sad world. He is able to do this because he is almighty God he desires to do this because he is a faithful father. Then if you turn with me to uh, John chapter 8 and turning to verse 37 of John, the Gospel of John chapter 8. I'll be reading verses 37 through 47. So Jesus is again talking to the people and he's talking and it's just, um, it's, it's strange because in verse 30 he spoke these words, many believed in him. Verse 31 tells us, then Jesus said to those Jews who believed in him, and, and so there's, there's people that are believers in this, in this crowd and there are unbelievers in this crowd. And uh, so in verse 37 we read, I know that you are, I should just start at verse 31. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, we are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? Jesus answered them, most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin, and a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. And I know that you are Abraham's descendants, but, I, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have seen with your father. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. You do the deeds of your father. Then they said to him, we were not born of fornication. We have one father, God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. You are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources for he is a liar and the father of it. But, I, but because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Which of you convicts me of sin? And if I tell you the truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears God's words. Therefore you do not hear because you are not of God. I'll sense our reading. And uh, well ask God um, to bless our, uh, the reading of his word. Father, again, having read your holy and infallible word, and, and as we delve into your scriptures and delve into the, just some sweet, amazing, powerful truths, Father, we, we, we come again in, uh, in need, asking for that grace that is sufficient. Father, for we know that in our human minds and hearts that we are no different than these, these people that uh, Jesus was speaking to that could not hear his words, um, they were filled with the spirit uh, of uh, their own desires. They were filled with the spirit of the devil. And um, their ears were closed to hear the words of the Holy One. But we pray, Father, that by the working of the Holy Spirit, 
by your presence here, that our hearts will be open to hear your word, to be encouraged, to be strengthened, to be lifted up. And for, for, for whoever has not yet known you and confessed you as, as Lord and Savior, Father, we pray, have mercy. Open their hearts so that they will know you while there is yet time. All these things we ask in Jesus' name alone. Amen. I had a, uh, a whole introduction set up for this sermon. And as I was working on it yesterday and today, I dumped the whole thing. Maybe some other day I'll use it. I, 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 it was awesome. Okay, I'll just tell you that. It was awesome. But... Uh, I, I was, my mind was changed, and because if, if you look at the Lord's Day, um, obviously, that's a huge question. What do you believe when you say, I believe in God the Father, Almighty Maker of the heavens and the earth? There, there's so much there. You could, you could preach for three, four weeks easily on that, on all the subjects that are touched upon there. But as I was working in John, and I'm working from a couple different places in the Gospel of John, I was reminded of a question that I've had for a long time, and I think that I want to start there. There was, there's, there's texts that we read sometimes, and we don't understand fully what they mean. They kind of sit there, yet we kind of have a feeling that, well, I think this is what it means, but we're not sure. Well, in Matthew 23, what's happening is Jesus is about to die. It's probably on Wednesday, and uh, I believe it's the last time that he's, that he's, that he's um, speaking in public in the, in the temple. And Matthew 23 is, uh, is, uh, is a fire. Um, it's probably one of the harshest rebukes that Jesus ever speaks against the Pharisees, the, the chief priests, uh, the religious authorities, the, the, the religious rulers. And I believe that he's doing it to, by God's grace. They, they haven't heard anything else, and so maybe it's one of those things that it'll snap them out of it, because I, I know that Jesus does what he does for their good. But right in the middle of Matthew 23, right in the middle of this indictment against these, because he calls them hypocrites and, uh, again and again, but then he says to his disciples, in the middle of this, in verses 8 through 10, he says, but you do not be called rabbi, because he's talking about rabbis and how they love the, the honor and the praise of men, and they like to be seated in the best places. And um, he says, but you, and he's looking at his disciples, he says, you do not be called rabbi, for one is your teacher, the Christ, and you are all brethren. I just want to stop one moment and give you a kind of a, uh, an, an extra note on that. But that's one of the reasons that I think that if we lift up the, the minister to this place, that, this high and holy place, what we've done is we've messed something up. We hold the word to be above all things. But a minister is just a man. A preacher is just a man. He's just a human being, and he's your brother. That's all there is to it. And we do hold the word up. And when the preaching is faithful and true, the preaching we hold up. But a minister is just a man. He's just like you. He may have a gift of preaching and teaching, but you also have gifts, and we are all equal. We are all brethren. And that's what I believe this text is saying. But that's not why Jesus is saying it. He does want us to understand that. But the next thing he says is, do not call anyone on earth your father. For one is your father. He who is in heaven. And, and that's the one that we're going to kind of look at tonight. It, because what a strange statement, right? Because we all have fathers. And, and we also know that all through the word of God, that when we talk about fathers, like the, the fifth commandment, honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in the land which, you're, which the Lord your God has given you. And, and basically, that's where part of my introduction had gone, is that, that no nation can be blessed for long who has forgotten what it is to honor the Father. And um, so why is Jesus saying, don't call anyone Father except for the one who is in heaven? But then he says in the next verse again, um, and do not be called teachers, for one is your teacher, the Christ. So if you look at that text, Matthew 23, verses 8 through 10, you'll see that verses 8 and 10 say about the same thing. Don't be called rabbi, for one is your rabbi, that is the Christ. And then it talks about the Father. Don't call anyone Father but the one who is in heaven. And then it says, and do not be called teachers, for one is your teacher, the Christ. And so what, what we usually call that in, in, in the Word of God is, is it's an inclusio. 
So the, the, the one verse and the other verse kind of give us the theme, but the center of it is, is the heart of the thing. And so what is happening there? Why is Jesus saying, don't call someone father? Don't call anyone father but the one who is in heaven. And I believe that that's what this text and what we'll be looking at in, in John, in the Gospel of John, is about. Brothers and sisters, tonight I'm just going to give us a basic, a very basic, hopefully simple, singular idea. And in the Gospel of John, Jesus reveals that the pattern for all that he does and says has been established for him by his Father. And so I believe that the Gospel of John helps us to understand what Jesus is saying in Matthew 23, verses 8, 9, and 10. He's telling us something about the Father. I believe in God the Father Almighty it has to begin with the idea that I know Jesus Christ. Because Jesus is the one who reveals the Father. And he reveals him in a very special way and for a very special reason. He says, so that I believe that God the Father, I believe in God the Father, means that he is the pattern and the model for all human behavior. Not just men, not just fathers, but all humans have the Father, and this is why the Father must be held up as singular, because men and women, men and women, we don't just look to God for an example of fatherhood. We look to God for an example and a model and a pattern for all human behavior. And that's what we're going to see um, with Jesus. For Jesus is the one who is the revealer of the Father. And, and so what I wanted to do is, is start out by just telling you, if you want to turn in your Bibles and look at this a little bit, um, I want to start in John chapter 5. And I'm just going to work through it, and, and you can kind of put the text in front of you. In John 5, verses 1 through 15, we find Jesus coming to the tabernacle, or to the temple on a Sunday, on a Sabbath, not on a Sunday. On a Sabbath, he comes, and he heals a man that has been infirmed and laying on his bed for 38 years. Okay? So he heals the man, and then he leaves, and the next thing you know, Jesus is getting in trouble. Why? Because what happened is he told the man to pick up his cot, to pick up his bed, and, and, and go. And, and so as the man picked up his bed and was walking through the, through the temple, um, some of the Jewish people, teachers and scribes and, and those that are learned in the law of God, accosted him. And they said, look, you're carrying your bed on the Sabbath. That's against the Sabbath. You shall do no work on the Sabbath. Carrying your bed is, and, and they had a very strict rules. I think there's like 625 different precepts and stuff that they came up with to uphold the Sabbath. And, and so they had very strict ideas of what you could and could not do on the Sabbath. You shall do no work. And so they're, why are you working and carrying your bed? And he said, well, the one who healed me told me to pick up my bed and, and go and to walk. And, and so then they come to Jesus and, and they uh, are accusing him of, um, of, breaking the, uh, of breaking the Sabbath. And so in verses 16 through 23 of chapter 5, we find Jesus having a discussion with the Jews about why he does what he does and when he does it. And the passage begins with this. For this reason, the, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them saying, this is his first part, okay? My father has been working until now and I have been working. And I believe that the whole idea is, is that since man fell into sin, that God works, right? He works continuously. And so now he's saying God works, the Father works continuously, and I work continuously. Okay? So in verse 18, this is, what, this is what comes next. Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him, because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his Father, making himself equal with God. Now if you remember what we just read in chapter 8, verses 37 through 47, at one point they say God is our Father, right? So th their objection is not to the fact that Jesus says that God is his father. Their objection is to the fact that he says that God has been working till now and I am working. And so what he's doing is he's making an equation that's very clear that he and the father are in some way equal. And that's, right, that's blasphemy. So he breaks the Sabbath and he's a blasphemer. So what we find is that now in verse 19, listen carefully to Jesus' defense of his words and actions. Then Jesus answered and said, 
Most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son does also in like manner. And the first thing I want us to see is that Jesus bases all that he does on what he has seen the Father do. Understand what Jesus is doing here. For Jesus, the Bible isn't just a set of doctrinal truths that we believe. Every word of God has profound meaning for all of Jesus' words and actions. Right? Too many people, I'll tell you what religion is, and, 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 and I think this is actually a good definition. If you study it, you'll see, I think, I think that you'll come to agree, that most religion is just us learning to do this, to believe these things, and to do this, this, and this. But that's not what, what Jesus does. What Jesus does is he actually lives out. Every word of God isn't about what I believe. It's believing and doing are the same thing to Jesus. Right? So whatever Jesus is reading in the Old Testament, he's interpreting, he's seeing things that the Father is doing and saying. And as the Son, he understands that that's what I'm supposed to do. For Jesus, the meaning of God being his Father, now listen carefully, because this is what is being told to us. Right? Because what are we thinking about when I say, I believe in God the Father? For Jesus, the meaning of God being his Father is all about looking to him for all knowledge of how he is to live in this world. And that truth wasn't just for the eternal Son of God. That truth is for every one of us. Why? Now listen carefully. Because Jesus is describing the meaning and the purpose of all human life. Man was created in the image and the likeness of God which simply means that if we're going to fulfill the meaning and the purpose of our lives, we need to see God the Father as the one who sets the pattern for all our deeds and all our words. We're made in the image and likeness of God. And that means that for us to to fulfill what we were created to do, that we have to see God, we have to see what he does, we have to hear what he does, and we have to do those things. Now, The problem is, is that in sin, in brokenness, you and I, like, we take the Old Testament scriptures and the New Testament scriptures, it doesn't really matter, but speaking in in relation to Jesus, Jesus is the ultimate interpreter of the Old Testament scriptures. He's the one that comes and sees all that's really there. He's the one that sees the difference between what the Bible says and what all these, all these, you know, the, these uh, religious leaders are doing, right? He sees the right of what they're doing. He sees the wrong of what they're doing because he is the ultimate, perfect interpreter of the words and deeds of God as they've been given to us in the scriptures. So part of the awesome beauty of God sending his eternal son is that Jesus could teach us that lesson, and the lesson being is what, what God does And what God says, he can teach us more than anybody that has come before him or anybody that came after him. And so, um, Jesus isn't done here, though, in his discussion. He says, I'm only doing what I see the Father do. And then in verse 20, he says, for the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does. And he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. The Father loves the Son, shows him all things that he himself does. And I find these words to be so awesome and so powerful because Jesus is telling his accusers and us that everything that that he does is good and righteous because the Son is only doing what the Father does and says. That's his defense. That's Jesus' ultimate defense to all his detractors. I'm only doing what the Word of God commands. And I'm going to tell you something. If you study carefully what these religious leaders, how they lived, how they acted, their pride, their arrogance, I'm going to tell you right now, you're going to see it in a lot of churches. You're going to see it in a lot of people who call themselves Christians. Because we do the same thing. Right? We take, the, we, we take all the doctrines of God, we turn them into rules, and I believe this. And you're holy because you say that you believe this. Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus comes into this world, 
And he actually shows us something about God that even all the religious and the most knowledgeable people of, of, of Judaism did not know. Jesus comes into this world and like no one before and no one since shows us the depth of God's goodness, the Father's goodness. He shows us the depth of the Father's love. He shows us the depth of the Father's grace. And he does that constantly and consistently through his whole life. That's what he does. And of course, the ultimate, right, the the ultimate uh, interpretation of the words of God in the Old Testament, Jesus goes to the cross. He does that because of what's revealed to him in the Old Testament. So, excuse me here. So, Jesus, as the ultimate interpreter of the scriptures, teaches us that a true son of the Father is known by the fact that he says and does what the Father says and does. In John 8, we see John, uh, Jesus teaching the same things, and, and again, to those who are accusing and judging him. At verse 28, he says, Then Jesus said to them, When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I do nothing of myself, but as my Father taught me, I speak these things. And I want to stop there for just a moment. When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know. And, and, I, and I could be wrong, and, and sometimes these are things, you know, um, sometimes the best way to figure things out is to talk to people about them, right? So here I am, I'm talking. And when he says, How, you will know, what does that mean? You will know when you lift me up. And, and I sense that what Jesus is talking about is the whole thing. He's talking about the cross and the resurrection, right? Because there's a lot of criminals that got hung on a cross. There's a lot of people that were lifted up. But what makes Jesus different? Well, for one thing, we know that he's 100% innocent. And he himself testifies to that, and he says, of what sin do you convict me, right? They they don't have any real charge to bring against him. They just disagree with his his interpretation. But he he says, you know, um, you'll lift me up and then you'll know. And I think the knowledge is not just seeing him dying on the cross. The knowledge comes when he's raised from the dead. Because Jesus being raised from the dead, and I, I love saying this since I learned it, because I didn't know it for a long time, but Jesus being raised from the dead is the ultimate proof that the Father approves and has accepted the sacrifice. It's the ultimate proof. Because otherwise, he just stays down there. He just stays in the ground. He just stays dead, okay? But he is raised up again, and they heard about it, and they knew it. So he says that uh, when you lift up the Son of Man, you'll know that I am he, and I do nothing of myself, but as my Father taught me, I speak these things. And he who, is, who, who sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I always do those things which please him. For I always do those things which please him. How does Jesus do what pleases him? Because God has revealed to him through his word what the Father does and what the Father says. And Jesus asked the Son, I believe in the Father. His testimony that I believe in God the Father is that I do all that the Father does and says. How do I know that I'm pleasing to the Father? Because I do all that he does and says. That's what it means to say, I believe in God the Father. That's what image bearers do. We must bear the image and the likeness of the one who made us in his image. So um, in verses 37 through 47, we see some implications of of how this comes out even to us. So Jesus is having this ongoing discussion with the Jews about how they are to relate to him, the Son of God, the Father. And um, they say in verse 37, it says that, um, you know, I know that you are Abraham's descendants. They have, they have claimed that, you know, in uh, verse 33, they have claimed we are Abraham's descendants. We are Abraham's children. We are Abraham's seed. That's the actual word. We are Abraham's um, seed. We come from Abraham. That's whose children we are. He says, I know that you are the seed of Abraham, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. Now listen to this. I speak of what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have seen with your father. And I think that Jesus is telling us something very profound about fatherhood. All of humanity has, has one of two different fathers. You are either of God the Father, 
or you are the children of the serpent, the devil. Okay, and that's what he's saying. He's saying you are not, you know, if you are truly children of Abraham, you'd be truly children of God. But you're not, because your deeds are evil. You see, and, and the connection, I think it's very simple, but again, it's, it's profound. What does it mean? I believe in God the Father. It means that we look to God as the sons and the children of God in Christ, that we look to him to know how to walk, how to talk, and how to act in this world. That's what it means when you say, I believe in God the Father. You believe that he is um, the ultimate expression of who we are to be. And Jesus is the rabbi, the teacher, who shows us that, what we could not see on our own. So they are claiming that Abraham's their father, and, and then Jesus says, I, I speak of what I've seen with my father, you do what you have seen with your father. They're seeking to kill Jesus. Jesus says, you're only doing what you have seen your father do. Right? So in their hearts, in their minds, um, they are following their father. Fatherhood is all about how you conduct yourself in word and uh, in action in the world. Jesus conducted himself the way that he did because he was a true son of the living God, and he did all that he had seen the father do and what he had heard from the father and of course who is their father and verse 44 you are of your father the devil and the desires of your father you do that text that that little excerpt that i had re read earlier in relation to ecclesiastes that is why we understand and can see both beauty and brutality because humans in sin have two fathers. Our God, God is the only one who gives life. He's the only one who brings us into the world. All human souls are given life and spirit by God. But in our flesh, as we follow the desires of the flesh, we're following our father, the devil. And, and, and the truth is, is, brothers and sisters, that Christians understand this. Because we understand that, we, that, that the spirit um, fights against the flesh we war and we battle against the flesh because it's in us. And, and that's one of the things that you can see in humanity. You can see somebody that can be such, so mean to people, and just nasty to people, and, and just not a good example at all. And then by the grace of God, in the next day or two or three or something, you see them do something amazing, something beautiful, something that brings tears to your eyes, and you wonder, how can that be? The child of God knows we are children of our Father. And it's Jesus Christ who comes. He's the fulfillment. And, and he, he really is the one who fulfills the... the he, he, to, 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 I'll just say it this way, the way that I wrote it. Okay, to say I believe in God the Father is to say that God is the pattern and model for all human behavior as we have been taught by our one rabbi and teacher, Jesus Christ, who is the fullness of God bodily. So when Jesus says, follow me, what he's doing is he's saying, I follow the Father perfectly, but the Father is spirit and you're flesh. So I came in the flesh so that you could see me. And by seeing me, you can see the fullness of the Father bodily. And so Jesus is the ultimate interpreter of who God the Father is, of his love, his mercy, his goodness, and his grace. He's the ultimate one who walks in the ways of the Father, and we follow him, our teacher, our rabbi, our guide, our savior. He shows us the way. So when you say, I believe in God the Father, you're saying, I was created in the image and in the likeness of God. And God has created me to be like him. And the only way I can do that is, first of all, by faith in Christ, and then by the, the, the strength that he gives me in his word and spirit to begin to follow Christ, to be a disciple and to follow after him faithfully. And then that way, I really begin to fulfill what it means to be and what I believe in God the Father. Amen. Our Father, once again, we come before you and uh, we thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for sending your only begotten Son into this world to be the fullness of the Godhead bodily. 
to come in in human flesh. For Lord, we are in human flesh. And, 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 and even as it says in, in Isaiah 55, that your ways are higher than our ways, your thoughts are higher than our thoughts. We, we cannot understand you. You are a, a God of infinite wisdom, infinite goodness, infinite grace, infinite love. And the truth is, is in sin particularly, we cannot see you. We cannot fully understand you. But in Jesus Christ, you came down to our level. You brought your son down into this world. And he is the one who shows us what it means to learn, to see the Father, to see what he does, to hear his words and to follow and whatever you say that we do. Father, we know that this is a deep truth and, 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 it's a, and honestly, it's almost overwhelming. But even as uh, the Apostle Peter says in 1 Peter 1 when he talks about the fact that, um, that there's, there's a mystery here that we take part in the divine nature, that in Christ, by faith, we begin to walk in the ways of God the Father. I believe in God the Father means that we believe that you, that we were created in your image and in your likeness and we are fulfilled by doing your will. Father, we pray that in Christ that we continue to grow in grace and truth, that we continue to grow in the knowledge of what it means to be a true son or daughter of the Most High God. And Father, we pray that in Christ that we begin more and more to look exactly like your children, that we look like the children of God. Father, we pray too that you'd be with all your people in this coming week, um, especially those that are in in, uh, dire situations, uh, whether persecution, whether in war, uh, whether uh, losing their jobs, not having enough food, etc. Lord, be with all your people, wherever they may be. Give us strength and grace to walk in the light of Jesus Christ. All these things we ask in his name alone. Amen.